So revolution and journalists kind of like made data love together at the moment. <laughs> um, so that drop. So it's based on the GNU FRO general public license. Um, it's used by the New Yorker, which is um, kind of like a leftist magazine in New York. It's written in Python. Um, it's only accessible on Tor hidden servers. Um, and there's a message box between the whistleblower and the journalist, so they can, when you, when the whistleblower would upload material, um, they get like um, like a small uh, number, which they could type in again when they come back, when um, the journalist or the whistleblower leaves a message, so they can have can have like a back and forth when the journalist doesn't really understand the material well. Um, and that drop only has one use case. It has been specifically designed to only um, to only be working for media outlets to have like a whistleblowing platform. Unlike Global Leaks, who kind of has like this massive list of use cases, um, and they kind of have like it outlined in that threat model, where they have like you know um, this is probably secure for a really big media organization, and it's less. Um, say for the whistleblower when it's being used in the city council uh, internally because it has a lot of metadata which might be retained and all that stuff. Um, and then some statistics. It only has like 500 lines of code and most of that um, is also some HTML with the templating stuff. Um, it's also in Python it um, kind of is like this PGP stuff, so it's it's really tiny, um, unlike the global league software, with like massive lines of code for all this kind of different things they are doing, um, and they kind of have like this entire infrastructure thing lined out, um, which is very interesting. So the hardware requirements for most of like for the New Yorker, for instance, is that you will need three computers with the hard drive still installed. Then you have like one computer which will be like um, with the hard drive removed, so they can do like um, analysis on that kind of laptop, so it doesn't save anything to the disk. Um, then you will have three USB sticks with tails, which is the um, a live CD created by people affiliated to the Tor project. Um, so this live CD pushes all your traffic over Tor, which is pretty nifty. And it has like this um, kind of memory scrubbers when you shut down. It has a metadata uh, reduction toolkit and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, then you need two USB sticks for transferring files. You will need one USB stick for storing the application's PGP private key, which is kind of odd. And then you also have for storing their personal PGP private keys. So this is pretty weird because why would you save these kind of like PGP keys not on a hardware token, right? This is what I would do. Um, if you have access to the private key, it's like on a USB key, you kind of have Im immediately have access to the entire key. If it's on a token, they need to do like a lot of work with microscopes and all that stuff to like hopefully recover the entire private key and all that stuff. And then you have like you need to oh I missed a, a slide. There's this you need to have like this firewall thing and a VPN and a whistleblowing system. So all the journalists connect through a VPN to the whistleblowing platform to retrieve all the leaks and the material. Well, if you look at global leaks, it's actually that all the journalists make use of a Tor hidden service um, instead of like using a VPN. Because what's actually important is that um, it isn't really known to the outside world which journalist has access through these kind of systems, so they can be targeted. Um, especially in the, in the US, there's kind of like this war against journalists and whistleblowing, and um, whistleblowers going on. So I think it's good if they would make use of a Tor hidden service instead of a VPN, um, that kind of stuff. Um, and then they have like this OSSEC um, thing, and it's a, it's a very complicated structure they have implemented. And OSSEC is kind of like an IDS system, well, it's not really an IDS system, it kind of like detects intrusions, but, and it will give you a notification if something has been breached after the fact. Um, but kind of like the thing is, is that 
why would you do it? Because if you are a really skilled attacker, you will probably circumvent this kind of stuff if it's an IDS. So, and especially if you have the capabilities of, like, say, the NSA or any other FBI organization or three-letter agency in the U.S., then you probably like can circumvent the uh, entire firewall and VPN thing and all that stuff. I kind of like messed up two slides. So I would like go for an open PGP card and a reader, which is like 40 euros for storing all the private keys. Um, so you only have to plug it in and the private key is generated on the hardware itself instead of your computer. So probably there's a true hardware random number generator on the board as well. So hopefully that's not flawed. And like maybe the other random number generators on certain systems. So I would go with that. Um, and then there's like generating the CA with the journalist here. So the journalist interface uses SSL certificates for transport, encryption, and authentication that will be generated on the local CA USB stick. Again, there isn't really a token used, or it's saved in a special place. Um, I guess that's kind of like whistleblowing infrastructure on the cheap. Um, because they obviously don't generate money with the leaks coming in for free, right? Um, and then they kind of like use a lot of puppet scripts which you can download, um, which also have some quirks. Uh, one of them, uh, actually I have a few, is that the Tor config is pretty weird. Um, they only have like this um, normal thing which I will show in a bit. Um, it kind of like download Python X without checksums. So like they have like this entire guideline of how you can set up like your GR security pack system and then you kind of like download Python dependencies without checksums, which is kind of like the other way around. Um, I guess I should use pip to the newest pip to authenticate these kind of like dependencies. And there isn't really like HTTP had a protection against um, cross-site scripting, um, X-Frame, X-Content, and CSP. So this is kind of like the Tor a config which they use now. So this is like run as daemon, so it kind of like runs the entire time. Um, it kind of like has the path for the hidden servers. It binds um, um, 127.111 to 8082 port 80 of the hidden servers. But what it actually should be is that, including this, um, this should be added, is that you cannot like make use of a virtual address network when um, it kind of like tries to resolve um, the other onions. Then you have like a transparent port which you could use uh, with um, a local listener address where you need to resolve other things outside of the Tor network. And also like I would probably make use of the DNS port when you will need to resolve any DNS of outside of the system. So it doesn't leak any DNS requests because Tor normally would leak a lot of DNS requests because it's um, UDP traffic and Tor doesn't tunnel most of the UDP traffic over the Tor network. So I would make use of um, these kind of things to um, secure things up just a bit more. Um, so I, I earlier thought about the, um, the laptops which they use, um, kind of like this laptop without and hard drive where they kind of like look through the um, material which you decrypt on those machines. Um, they make use of an Ubuntu Live CD, which maybe isn't really bad. Um, however, it doesn't really do memory wiping when um, somebody would come in and would try to grab your laptop for whatever reason, whether it's a fat or it's some criminal who wants to steal your laptop. And the GPG key is still on the USB stick, um, which, uh, again, I would use um, a um, an token for. And instead of like a Ubuntu Live CD, I would actually use Tails. Because what's great about Tails is that it has this metadata reduction toolkit, so, which isn't really perfect. It kind of like misses a way to um, strip um, all the metadata from doc. Um, it can strip the, the, um, the stuff from a dark X, but not from dark. So we had some trouble as well at Publix that um, some journalists were not really, um, they weren't really warned enough apparently because the training was a bit of a mess that 
This isn't like a gift from God which will strip all the metadata from all the stuff you ever wanted. Um, it has some quirks. Um, however, with the quirks in mind, it's still a really good thing to use and it has all these kind of things that um, a journalist would use or an activist or whatever to um, securely publish um, these uh, kind of things. Um, so, kind of like that's about it for that drop. Then we go to Global Leaks. So, Global Leaks has the same license, the general public license. It kind of has like all these major, all these use cases. Um, it's mostly in Python as well, with some HTML templating and all that stuff. Um, I don't know why I said another time globally. Uh, oh yeah, the interesting thing is, is that it doesn't really run on free software. Um, it only is compatible with, with Ubuntu 12.04 distribution, which is kind of sucky. It kind of like runs on Debian, but you spend an entire weekend on getting it to run. <laughs> this is kind of sucky. Um, and they are backed by the non-profit of the Hammers Transparency Center in um, Italy, which is like, um, we will create some wide variety of software projects like GlobalX, tour to web um, the anonymous, anonymous Python web thingy as well. Oh well. So, kind of like about the infrastructure. So, Unlike that drop where you have like, um, where you can only access it, the whistleblowing system over a Tor hidden service, um, this makes use of a GlobalX installation and a Tor to web server. So normally the GlobalX installation is only accessible uh, over a Tor hidden service, so it's anonymous. The thing is, is that they also created a platform which is called tor to web and what it does is that you go to this website like called tor to weborg and you want to browse to an onion, which is like a Tor hidden service, and you don't want to install Tor, you can go to this website, resolve the, the web server would resolve the, the Tor hidden service and you can like go to the hidden service without installing Tor. So, Tor to web is kind of like this thing over SSL you can like send information to, um, which I'm not really sure if this really makes sense for a whistleblowing platform, since this IP is known, right? So they kind of like could um, track like whoever is connecting through this IP of the Tor to web node, and if somebody is sending, um, is connected for longer than a few minutes and sending a lot of bytes, they can probably figure out like that something is going on and somebody is leaking information. Um, I would rather like don't, don't do it over Tor and just set up some sort of dummy proxy if you really need to, um, together with an SSL with an S SSL tunnel. Um, but probably you would only want to have a Tor hidden service. The problem is like, do people actually understand these kind of technologies? Um, but on the other side, if you're a really good whistleblower, you probably want to invest some time into securing your ass and not to get arrested. So, which probably brings us to another different point is that I guess the people from GlobalX and TotalWeb should work on to write some sort of whistleblowing guideline on how to securely whistleblow, which is probably like step one, like educating the whistleblower um, to do. Um, so kind of like GlobalX is an open source project aims at creating a worldwide anonymous censorship resistant distributed whistleblowing platform. Um, which okay. Um, however, the leaks no node are really distributed. You only have one installation of the GlobalX installation. When that node goes down, you're fucked when that server gets raided. So they really say that it's distributed. Maybe they um, maybe they mean with that is that it goes through the Tor network, so maybe that's why it's distributed. I'm not really sure. Um, they at some point want to create uh, multiple global instances where you could leak to, which kind of like sync together with all the um, things. Um, but at the moment, the distributed thing is not really possible. Um, and it's only accessible over Tor hidden service, which is great. Um, but maybe that's why they say it's a distributed network of some sort. Um, so GlobalX kind of have like, you kind of have like GlobalX, which is like the, um, 
the main thing for a lot of different components of the entire Global X framework. Um, you have like GL backend and GL client, and GL client is kind of like the um, HTML templating web stuff. Um, the journalists need to generate these PGP keys themselves. Um, and they, um, the um, nodes, sysadmin can insert new GP keys, uh, but they themselves as well. The thing is, what I saw, um, and I was looking around at the globalist thing, is that when you are the admin of the platform, you are automatically trusted. Um, the thing is, is that it leaks a lot of metadata when you actually like look at the screen where you log in as a sysadmin, you kind of like see, oh, it's been leaked by that time, this has been leaked, this is the file name, and that kind of stuff. <coughs> Even though it's encrypted, it leaks a lot of metadata to the file names and all that stuff. So there's a lot of trust on your shoulders when you do that, but when you would compromise the admin of some sort, you automatically see a lot of metadata of what it got leaked and all that stuff. So maybe this will get changed in like the next versions or so, but I'm not really sure what they, what they are going to come up with to. Um, so yeah, it's mainly written in Python. It scales to like unlimited receivers as much as you want. Um, the node admin needs to be trusted, and it only works on Ubuntu 12.04. Um, um, and what I mean by receivers is kind of like at Publix, we can have like all these media partners, and you can select like I want to leak this material to media partner A and media partner B, but not to the rest of the media partners. And then these media partners need to work together to release this material, which is pretty interesting in itself as well, because the journalists normally don't really want to, you know, they don't want to share scope with somebody else. Um, so we kind of like force them to work together. Um, which hasn't really happened to date yet, which I would really like to see this happen, is that they work more together instead of like seeing each other as competitors in the field. Um, so that's pretty interesting. Um, so then, um, ready for recept generated. So the recept is kind of like this, when the whistleblowing whistleblower has uploaded material, you can have like a 10 digit number, uh, which you could insert later on where you would come back and leave a, a message for the journalist or the journalist has leaves a message for you. And then you can decide whether you actually want to reply to that matter. Um, and it kind of like stores the receiver's password hash with a random 128 bit salt, unique for each user. And the salt is obtaining hashing for the SHA-512, the receiver username. Um, I don't know, maybe it's just really bad. Maybe I would say to use Whirlpool, which is a bit slower to crack, or as script. Yeah, I would actually go with script, probably. Which is uh, quite slow. Um, kind of like the quirks of both systems is that they don't do metadata cleanup themselves. The journalists actually have to do that. And uh, next to that, there is a lot of timing correlation which you could do between the various leaks and all the various platforms. Um, and it doesn't really, oh yeah, it kind of like detects, what did, what did I mean with that actually? It kind of like detects proxies. Um, when you would go to the Tor to web kind of thing, it will detect like you are using Tor or you're using some other kind of um, normal connection. So it will detect and redirect you to the right um, uh, URL. So Tor to web kind of like goes to, if you have like secure.publish.nl and you go there as a no user, you would get redirected to the normal SSL website. And with Tor, you will get redir redirected to the Onion kind of thing, which is the Tor hidden service. Um, which kind of like brings us to Tor to web. Um, it's also written in Python. It accesses Tor hidden services without installing Tor. It's accessible over SSL. So unlike the normal globalist installation where it's confidential and anonymous, this is only confidential and not anonymous. Since you can like, connect to one node which has like, um, you know, if they really want to in a country, they kind of like can target you. Uh, of who connects and who sends files through this IP address. Um, the good thing is, is that it can scale up to thousands of nodes if you want to. So you could have like a lot of IP addresses or IPv6 to connect to this kind of thing. Um, so next to that, of not only 
using it for Tor, they implemented the Tor to web dummy mode, which is kind of like a really dumb proxy. Um, and this was created because Tor kind of have like a problem with this really big botnet, which is on the on the Tor network itself, which kind of like makes it a l unusable when we were going to launch like a few days before, which was a fucking problem since it was really slow. Like it took us like 15 minutes to kind of like uh, connect to the hidden service or even resolve it. So then we were like, fuck, what do we need to do? So we created a way to um, have Tor to Web like do all these proxies things. So we can have like a static um, three link connection through various servers, which ends up at the um, GlobalX node uh, of the installation. And we do most of this stuff through uh, Renet Day, which is kind of like this proxy thing, uh, socks thing. And all the connections are secured using S tunnel, um, using a direct um, connection to the GlobalX uh, installation with perfect forward secrecy ciphers and all that stuff. Which isn't perfect, but it's kind of like if you go through multiple jurisdictions, it's probably safe enough. Um, so they need to work together to get all the metadata and get it like if they really want to, which kind of like takes a few months. Um, so you can have all the other nodes again if you need to. So, again, about these news use cases is that. It can be used for media outlets, it can be used for corporate compliance, it can be used for the local municipality and the government tax whistleblowing kind of thing internally. The problem is, is that you kind of have like different threat models for all these kind of like different things that are listed here. And I don't think you can really make one shoe that fits all right. So this is kind of like, it's not really a problem maybe, or well, it kind of is because you kind of have like a different threat model for like a media outlet or like uh, your local municipality. Because these GlobalX installations in a local municipality will be hosted internally where people could connect to. They have like the entire MAC address and kind of like probably like some data retention going on locally so they can see like who connected to who. Um, which normally, if they would have good reels and a good whistleblowing law, the whistleblowers probably wouldn't get prosecuted. This is often not really the case, as we have noticed in history. So it's not only technology, I guess. There's also some, you know, some, um, uh, what's the word for it? Balls of, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. <laughs> so um, the, the awesome quirks is that the Tor to app thing needs to be compiled um, so Tor needs to be manually compiled and you need to kind of like do manual patches in there. So you need to maintain it by hand, which is a fucking pain in the ass. Um, so Tor has a lot of problems at the moment with this kind of thing. So if people are interested in hacking on that, so we must appreciate it. So I don't have to maintain this by hand, which is a fucking pain. Um, and then like, Two days before we launched, um, I think I reported 10 bugs in the GlobalX software thing. Like every time we were almost there, and I think, yes, I can go to sleep at 3 a.m. They were still patching bugs. So like, you know, at some point I even asked them, do you guys think this is stable software which can be used in a production environment? Yes. I have my doubts about that. So they're going to do a code-based cleanup at this point. Um, I'm really excited about that. So hopefully they can like make it smaller and um, all that stuff. Um, some organizations inside um, different regions around the world are interested in having more GlobalX installations around the world. So hopefully um, there's uh, some money left in their funding to actually do some more auditing. And at the moment, Lease Authority, who is the, um, like the company from Zuku who created um, Tabulas, um, is doing an audit on the entire code base. So I'm really interested um, in uh, what they find. These guys are pretty fucking cool. Um, and next to that, um, some developers of GlobalX have really owned RSA keys bits, like 1024. Like, this is one of the main developers. This is also one of the main developers. This isn't really a developer. I don't think this is a developer either. But maybe it's time to actually upgrade some keys to like 4,096 bit keys. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> all right, all right, ECC. Um, so kind of like, what? <laughs> um, which kind of like brings us to which one to choose, right? So I guess this is kind of like depending on the use case. If you want some sort of system for your local tax municipality whistleblowing system, I would definitely go with GlobalX because it's kind of like made for this. Um, if you are actually in like a media outlet, I think you want a really small code base um, with some modifications um, of some configurations and all that stuff. I would definitely go with that drop because it's really easily maintainable and very good code. Um, so I guess that's kind of like the conclusion um, of this talk. Um, and we kind of like need to hack the system as well because we need a lot of better whistleblowing protection laws all around the world. I know that Emi has been working on this. Um, I, kind of. <laughs> um, but I think it's really good to come up with like, um, I know also Suliet Dreyfus uh, who wrote um, who co-authored um, Underground together with Julian Assange, have been working on the whistleblowing survey of what society kind of thinks about whistleblowers, if they are supportive or not, or not supportive. And kind of like the general attitude is that society is really supportive of whistleblowers. It's just that the people in power are not really, um, <laughs> surprise, not supportive of whistleblowers. So the general consensus is that Whistleblowers are very welcome in society, and we kind of like need to make use of that to come up with better laws and better definitions of what whistleblowers actually are. Um, yeah. So, um, I guess Q and A. No questions. Flames. Know that there's an here in global installation, right? Yeah. Okay. I was going to meet up with the guy, but I didn't have a lot of time in Hungary. Well, in Budapest. Which is too bad. All right. Um, this is my PCP fingerprint and my OCR fingerprint. Um, can you verify that for us? Like, can you state, just check that this is my. For the record, this. These are my fingerprints. <laughs> oh yeah, don't sign my key. I don't believe in this web of trust shit. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. Thank you.